chapter 4, we're going to be looking this morning at verses 1 to 26. And why don't we go ahead and stand for the reading of God's holy word in Genesis 4, verses 1 to 26. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? and Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to his Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And when he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Then Enoch, to Enoch was born Erod, and Erod fathered Mehujael, and Mehujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Adah, and the name of the other, Zillah. Adah bore Jubal, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Well, brothers and sisters, this is the word of God. And once more, God's people said, thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do come before you today and we we ask, O oh Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds to understand and to receive the word that you have given to us this morning. Lord, we pray that you would show us how this points to the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, and what it calls us, how it calls us to live in light of the gospel. 
So, Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anger. It's just one word. Anger. We, we all experience it. We've all been on the receiving end of anger from someone else. And we know that that's not pleasant. And yet, we also know what it's like to be the one who is doling out anger in one way, shape, or form. Every one of us has given it and has received it in our own lives. And obviously, anger, it doesn't take a genius to to realize, anger demonstrates hostility between two people who do not see eye to eye uh, on any issue. Now, if you remember back in chapter 3, particularly verse 15, we saw that there was a promise that God gave Uh, to Adam and Eve when he was judging the serpent and that promise concerned a specific seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And remember what God said, I will put hostility or enmity between these two seeds. Well, in our passage this before us this morning, we see this hostility played out between these two seeds and the instrument of that hostility is anger anger. And in this passage, our our big idea, as you see, uh, printed in the bulletin, if you're visiting, we print our main idea in the bulletin. The main idea is that unjustified anger, like all sin, has the power to consume us, to earn the judgment of God, and it leaves a legacy of brokenness behind us. It's a, it's a, That's the idea. Unjustified anger, like all sin, has the power to consume us, to earn the judgment of God, and it leaves a legacy of brokenness behind us. And so this morning, as we jump into this passage, I want to begin our first point, which is the root of anger in verses 1 through 8. In verses 1 through 8. We see in verses 1 through 2 the setting uh, that, that, you know, lays the stage for this anger. Our passage begins very simply in verse 1, that Adam and Eve conceive and give birth to their firstborn son, Cain. Now notice what Eve says in verse 1. She says, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Now, interestingly enough, the, the, the Hebrew is, is kind of rough to translate and understand, but the gist of it is, if you're reading between the lines and you're keeping this in, in the context of what God had said in chapter 3, it is clear that Eve believes that Cain would be the coming seed of the woman. Now, that's kind of ironic given where this passage is going to go, but it does show a measure of faith, in a sense, in Eve's heart. She is hoping that this child, this firstborn son that she's been giving birth to, is going to be the fulfillment of God's promise of this being the seed of the woman who's going to come to crush and destroy the serpent. Now, when she gives birth to his brother, she names him Abel. And we see that as well in this introductory part of the passage. Interestingly enough, Abel's name in Hebrew means vanity, or it means something that is fleeting away or frail. In fact, it's the same basic word that the author of Ecclesiastes, who I think is King Solomon, uses when he says, Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. And remember, he's talking about everything being vain under the sun. It's fleeting away. And that's the meaning of of Abel's name. You kind of wonder what Adam and Eve were thinking when they named him. Was there some physical condition that that showed a weakness in him that maybe made them feel like his life would be fleeting away? I I don't know. But the name clearly has a significance when the story unpacks, that his life is indeed going to be short and fleeting away. Now notice the description that we find in these first two verses as well. As these brothers grow up, you know, side by side and in the same family, under the same two parents, with the same upbringing, Cain takes the vocation of being a farmer of the ground. And Abel takes on the vocation of a keeper of sheep or or a shepherd. Now, it's interesting that Moses, when he's describing their work, he mentions Abel first and Cain second, even though in their birth order, it's exactly the opposite. 
And I think that that's part of what leads us to the problem that we do see in verses 3 through the beginning of verse 5. We see the underlying problem of how this anger begins to arise. Look at me again at verses 3 through 5. We begin in verse 3 by seeing an offering that, that, that Cain gives. Now, interestingly enough, anger arises within the context of worshiping the Lord. I don't know about you, but that's not exactly the context you would expect uh, this, this you know, episode of anger to, to start in. But it, it begins in the context of worshiping the Lord. Look at verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Okay, let's stop there. On the surface, it's hard to detect what the problem is. We know that Cain is a farmer of the ground, and we know from the rest of, of the Old Testament and even into the New, New Testament, that's not a dishonorable vocation. It's an honorable vocation to farm the ground. It's also not dishonorable that he came with an offering to the Lord. After all, it shows evidence very early on in human history that, that man was made to worship God. And even after the fall, Adam and Eve clearly taught their children that it was necessary to worship the Lord through the offerings that they give. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, well, what's the problem? Some have argued that, you know, it's because Abel's, blood, Abel's offering, as we'll see in a moment, ha included the shedding of blood and Cain's did not. But that's not really a problem because if you go on and you read the Levitical laws, particularly Leviticus chapter 2, you know, Israel was called to bring offering from the ground. So there's nothing wrong inherently with what he offered. It's okay to give God an offering from the fruit of the ground. But what's the problem? Well, the problem is, and you have to really read carefully here, Cain brought some of the fruit of the ground not the first fruits. Now, sometimes these minor details really make or break the story and the situation that's going on. And that's what we find here. He did not bring the best of his crop. He merely brought a portion. He, he took the crop that he had and he just took a portion and said, this should be good enough for God. God should be happy with the, whatever I give him. I'll just bring him this. Think about what that reveals about his view of God that underlies his anger. Because at the end of the day, when we talk about unjustified anger, unjustified anger in our own hearts always has some root within us of how we perceive God. And that's the beginning of Cain's problem here. And we see the contrast in verse 4. We see the offering of Abel. Look at me there. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. Now notice the qualitative difference. Cain simply brought some of a portion of the fruit of the ground that he tilled. Abel brings the best. And any, any Israelite Hebrew reader or, or hearer of this passage in Moses' day would understand the qualitative difference. They knew because it was required in the Levitical laws of sacrifice in, in the rest of the Old Testament that they bring the fat portions, they bring the best of their flock, the firstborn, the cream of the crop. And that's exactly what Abel did. That's exactly what he did. It reveals something very different about Abel's view of who God is and what he's worth and what he deserves and the faith that underlies his offering. You know, it's, it's not without importance that the author of Hebrews in chapter 11 states about Abel, Abel's offering. He gave an offering by faith to the Lord and he was accepted because of that faith, right? It's not the offerings in and of themselves. It's the heart behind which they are given that makes the difference between Cain and Abel here. And the response of God is very clear. The end of verse 4 and the beginning of verse 5 says, And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. 
that Hebrew word for regard just simply means God looked favorably and accepted Abel's offering, but did not look favorably on Cain's and did not accept. Why? Because God does not look at things the way that man looks at things. God sees the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7. And God judges the heart. And that's what God's responding to here. But it ends with Abel or Cain being envious and jealous of his brother, as we see as the passage unfolds at the end of verse 5 and through verse 7. Look at how this, this insidious sin of anger unfolds. It says at the end of verse 5, So Cain was very angry and his face fell. It's not that he was angry. He was very angry angry. And that description is really important because God is the one who acknowledges it in verse 6. He confronts Cain with the question, uh, and think about God coming as a patient, as a loving father to a son to confront him and kind of help set him straight uh, on an issue that he sees his son having. Look what he says in verse 6. He, he, he confronts him about why are you angry? That's what he says. Why are you angry? Now, it's not that he doesn't know. He's God. He knows everything. But think about what that question is designed to do. It's designed to open Cain up and get him to talk. Why are you angry? And by the way, why has your face fallen? That's not an unimportant term. That, that term, why is your face fallen, uses a Hebrew verb uh, to fall, and I'm going to, I usually, it's not important to do this all the time, but it's helpful. In this case, the verb is nafal. And when it says that Cain's face has fallen, it's related to the, ver to the word nephilim, which we're going to see in chapter 6. You th we think of the nephilim as these giants who lived on the earth in the pre-flood times. Well, they are the fallen ones. And where do they come from and who are they related to? Cain, the fallen one. Why has your face fallen? Now, it's interesting to me that between verses 6 and 7, there is no answer from Abel or Cain. But God tells him what he needs to do with his anger. He says two things in verse 7. You know, if you do well, will you not be accepted? By the way, that, that word accepted there is the Hebrew verb that means to rise, be lifted up. Think about it. His face is fallen. He's angry. But if you do well, won't your face be lifted up? Won't you be able to stand before me? That's the one thing he says, but what if you don't? And if you do not do well... End of verse 7. Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Now, if you're really paying attention, um, that, that wording there, you know, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you. The ESV says contrary to you. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. That should sound very familiar to you. It goes back to Genesis 3. Uh, 16 in the second part of that verse. Do you remember when, when God was judging Eve for her sin and complicity in the fall? Do you remember what he said? Your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. And I explained that a few weeks ago that the, the desire that she had for her husband, what that means is she is going to desire to usurp his role of authority, his headship. As the man and the, as the head of the family. Her desire is going to be to dominate him and control him. And how is he going to respond in his sin? He's going to dominate you and rule over you. And, and I said, that's not a nice phrase. And it doesn't give men permission to just dominate their wives. It just states that in sin, that's going to happen. Think about when you take that and you apply it to Cain here. Sin, sin's desire is for you. Sin desires to usurp the authority and control you. Sin desires to dominate you. 
Sin desires to consume you, Cain. But you must rise up and you must rule over it. In the same violent term, tread it under your foot. Show it who's boss. Now, the question at this point is, what can we learn from Cain's example about the workings of our own anger? So as we step back, we can learn that sinful anger, and mind you, I said sinful anger, always begins with pride and follows a trajectory of envy and jealousy, and it leads to consuming us before it bears its final fruit, which we'll look at in just a moment. I think about that. Sinful anger begins with pride. And I say sinful anger because not all anger is evil. Not all anger is wicked. Where do I get that from? Well, I get that from Ephesians 4.26 in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul tells the Ephesians, uh, be angry and do not sin. It's possible to be angry and not sin. Did you know that? Not all anger is is sinful. Not not every time you get angry do you have to feel bad. Sometimes it's a righteous thing to be angry. I want you to unpack that for just a moment. Cain's problem here is that he thought too highly of himself in relation to God. And that's why his offering wasn't accepted. Why do we get angry often? Why do I get angry often? I'll tell you, sometimes it's a struggle when my expectations aren't met. And my assumption is that it's probably the same for you if you're like me, and you probably are like me because we all have the same sin nature. I remember my mother told me one time a few years ago, she said, yeah, when you were a kid, man, you were a handful when we had plans to do something as a family and something came up and the plans fell through and we had to, on the fly, change the plan and do something else. She's like, of all my kids, you were the one that was hardest to deal with. I said, why? Because you got angry. (laughs) You got frustrated that your expectations of what you thought were going to happen didn't happen. I thought, how about that? (laughs) Okay, sorry. Sorry, Mom. Why? Why does pride enter into the equation because oftentimes we think that God in our lives should should do things a certain way we think he should deal with us in a certain way and sometimes we find ourselves in situations where we don't it looks like we're not getting the the pleasure of God or the approval of God in our lives and we read our circumstances that way now in Cain's case that was true But isn't it interesting that anger has fundamentally at its root the idea, the the assumption that somehow God is angry with us. Now in our sin, before we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, that is true. The Psalms make it very clear God is angry with sinners every day. Is it any wonder that people who are on the receiving end of God's anger are, are angry? It shouldn't be a surprise. It shouldn't be a surprise that maybe they struggle with anger. But with God's people, it should be a little different. And so as we think about our anger, maybe we need to take a step back and ask, is there any pride mixed in with my anger? Am I assuming and presuming something from God that maybe he didn't promise or is not there? And we all know when we see God... Or from our own perspective, God dealing with somebody in a way that we think is probably more gracious than he's dealing with us, it's easy to get envious and angry and jealous, isn't it? Now, how come he gets that? How come I can't have that? <laughs> right? And often that, that's what the, the root of pride develops into when we look at this trajectory of anger. You know, Cain assumed that God would approve him for just simply giving a mediocre sacrifice. And when God approved of Abel, who gave, had a heart to give his very best, he envied his brother. Again, take a step back. Is there, is there someone around you today, whether it's maybe your spouse, um, if you're younger, a parent, or, or if you're a little older and have kids, your kids or friends or neighbors or someone in church sitting around you here. Maybe there's someone you're envying this morning. Maybe there's someone you're jealous of this morning that you need to take a step back. <laughs> 
And again, examine the motives of your heart. Because the reality is sinful anger, like all sin, can consume and rule over us. What an interesting diagnosis that God gives, isn't it? Sin is crouching at the door. I think of like the picture that pops in my mind is like a lion out in the field and he's blending in with the tall grass and he's creeping up on, on a, you know, an animal that he's going to prey on and, he's, and, and he locates the animal and then he stops as he gets a little close but keeps his distance and crouches down, blends in and all of a sudden, boom, springs out of the grass and latches onto the jugular of that animal, drags it down and kills it and then consumes it with the pride and the other lions. That's the idea here. And that's, that's what God is saying our sin and our anger is like. When we don't rule over it, when we don't dominate it, it dominates us. Think about a time you've been angry. You know how this works. Somebody really angers you for some reason, whether it's legitimate or not, is not the issue at this point, but they make you angry. And what do you do? You think about it. And then you don't just think about it in one moment of time, but what else do you do? You start rehearsing it over and over and over in your mind. And if you've ever seen a movie being filmed, I mean, how many times do they, like, you know, film one little scene, you know? Probably 10, 15 times because the director wants to get it just right. You start rehearsing it over and over and over again. Cut! Action! Cut! action. And every time it runs in your mind, it runs a little differently and a little worse and a little worse and a little worse. And the more it runs in your mind and rehearses in your mind, it starts playing on your emotions, doesn't it? You start to get angrier and angrier and more bitter and cynical. Until at last, in your mind and in your heart, the situation is so blown out of proportion, so blown up, That forgiveness is almost impossible because of what that person did to you. And what does it do? It consumes you. And then it consumes that relationship you have with that person. And then you act out of that cynicism, out of that bitterness, out of that, that anger. You act on that perception, which is the worst possible perception you could use and look at it with. And then you act out on that, and what does it do? It has the power to destroy not just you and consume you. It has the power to destroy those around you, doesn't it? Boy, that's what we see here. And as we go on to our second point here in verses 9 to 16, um, I'm going to include verse 8, actually. In 8 to 16, you see the, God's judgment on anger because of what this boils into. I, I've just looked at the trajectory of anger with you. This next second point begins with the fruit fully born and then how God deals with it. Look at verses 8 and 9. You see the sin that is behind God's coming judgment. Now in verse 8, you know that Cain did not take the Lord's advice. Because we see in verse 8 the murder that leads to judgment. Look at, look at verse 8 with me. Cain spoke to Abel his brother, And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Now again, we we looked at this last fall um, from 1 John chapter 3, which we read earlier this morning. When it says that that Cain killed his brother or murdered his brother, the, the verb in the original Greek of the New Testament implies a slaughter. Not to sound graphic, but slitting the throat ear to ear. That's a violent way to kill somebody. He killed his brother in the field. You see, his anger didn't just consume him. It also consumed physically and literally the life of his brother. And in verse 9, you see his unrepentant response. This is the epitome of of coldness and hardness. Look at verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother? as if he didn't know, right? (laughs) And he says, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now think about and compare when Adam and Eve sinned in in chapter 3, God calls them out. He asks a similar question. Where are you? What did they do? They came out from among the trees. Now, they were covered in those fig leaves, right? But they at least somewhat fessed up to this. What is it you have done? 
Who told you that you were naked? And we talked about how everything they said was factual, short of taking responsibility for what they did. They at least admitted truthfully what had happened. Do you see the same thing with Cain? Where is your brother? I don't know. Bold-faced lie. And then if that's not bad enough, am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> yeah. You are his older brother. God knew what had happened. What an unrepentant response. Rooted in a hard is it any wonder that he's unrepentant? Is it any wonder that his heart is so hard when he allowed himself to be consumed through and through by sin and anger? No, it shouldn't surprise you. So what does God do in verses 10 through 16? He gives his judgment on this unrepentant sin. In verses 10 through 12, God judges his sin of murder. Now, God doesn't keep the dialogue going. He just jumps right to judgment. And in verse 10, it's really, I mean, there's some poetry here going on in how the dynamic works, but justice can be poetic, isn't it, often? Look what he says in verse 10. What have you done? Again, as if he didn't know, he knew. How do you know that? Because what he says right next. The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. That word, that verb is crying as a participle. It is ongoing continuously. Now, those of you who had children know, because you had to wake up in the middle of the night when they were really young, when they're hungry, they cry, and they keep crying and crying and crying and crying and crying until you get up and deal with the child's hunger. That's the idea here. The, the blood of your brother Abel is crying and crying and crying and crying continuously from the ground to me. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. I kind of like the way the King James says it because it's just so much like, mm, like a fugitive and a vagabond you will be on the earth, right? He's going to have no home on the ground. What a judgment. It's a judgment that relates to his vocation and his calling as a farmer who worked the ground like his parents. He's judged according to his calling, but he's also judged according to the crime. The ground has soaked up and drank your brother's blood. It will not yield for you any longer what it once did. He's going to be a fugitive and a wanderer, and he's going to be homeless on the earth. That's his lot. And you see his continued unrepentance. I mean, this is just like, it adds insult to injury. It's like salt in a wound in verses 13 through 14. Now, what's really interesting about this is you don't hear him apologize or have any remorse for what he did. It's not like, oh, I, I've killed and murdered my brother. What have I done? I, I've, I've violated you, O oh Lord, because I've attacked my brother who bears your image. Uh, how is this going to affect my parents, my mother who carried him for nine months and gave birth to him and raised us both and all the loss that I'm going to suffer now that I've killed my brother? You don't hear anything like that. What do you hear? Well, look what you hear in verses 13 and 14. Cain says, my punishment is greater than I can bear. He only thinks about himself. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. He only cares about what the consequences are that he is going to have to bear. He doesn't care about what he's done. He doesn't care. There's no sense of gravity. It only highlights his unrepentance. And then his, his sentence is carried out. And I'm just going to focus on verse 16 where the sentence is carried out. Then Cain went away. Don't miss this from the presence of the Lord. There's alienation from him and God. 
He's driven away in a sense, and he settles in the land of Nod, east of Eden. By the way, when he says, I will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, that word wanderer comes from the Hebrew word um, Nod. That's what the word means. He goes to the land of wandering, east of Eden. Again, let's take a step back. What do we see God do with those who refuse to repent of their sin and their anger? Well, very clearly, when people absolutely refuse to repent of their sin and they harden their hearts, like like anger in this case, God gives them over to the consequences and judgment of their sin. It may sound unfair, but it's entirely just. God hands people over to the judgment and the consequences of unrepentant sin. This is a hard reality for sinful people to stomach, especially in our day and age where God is seen as only loving. And by the way, did God give Cain what he really deserved? Life for life? No, he still showed him grace. He still showed him grace. But when people are unwilling to admit that they've done something wrong, what it does is it reveals a hardness of heart on their part. And oftentimes in Scripture, God just gives people over to the consequences of their sin. Okay, you want to harden your heart? If that's the sin you want to cling to and you want to love on, I'm going to give you that sin. I won't take it away from you, but I'm not taking the consequences away either. What is this a call for for us? Well, it's a call to repentance, isn't it? In, 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 first, in 2 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 7.10, the apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church about a discipline case that they had to work through. And basically what happened, if you read those letters and you know the background, there was a man that was found to be uh, carrying on a sexual relationship with his stepmother, his father's wife. And the Corinthians at first were pretty boastful about it. Paul calls them to... to excommunicate this guy and the point of the excommunication was to bring him to a point of repentance to show him what the gravity of his sin really was and praise the lord you get to second corinthians and you find in chapter two the man did repent the man repented in sorrow and tears and paul says receive him back receive him back with open arms that was the point of the discipline but he goes on to say for godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. What's the point? Well, the point is that godly grief is concerned with how uh, our sin that we commit commit grieves the heart of the Lord. And we find ourselves grieved with the same grief that God has for our sin. And in sharing that grief that God has for our sin on behalf of our own sin, it leads us to repentance. We turn away from it because of how we know it grieves the heart of God who loves us so. But again, what is is the worldly sorrow about? It's just about being sorry only because now you have to deal with the consequences. Now think, think about in your own life, There's probably examples of both of those in your life. There's there's certainly examples of godly grief and sorrow which have led you to repentance, turning to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's how you got saved. But through the process of sanctification, sometimes we all struggle with, you know, there's not quite a godly sorrow of, of repentance. There's a worldly sorrow as, man... These consequences are just so hard. And brothers and sisters, I just want to just alert you to the fact that that worldly sorrow is never going to produce the repentance that leads to the fullness of life that is promised in Jesus Christ. And so what we need to ask ourselves this morning is, are we repentant over our sin by seeing it from God's perspective and turning from it? Or are we only concerned like Cain with how our sin has inconvenienced us? And it's, that, it's the legacy of that inconvenience that leads us to our third and final point this morning, the legacy of anger in verses 17 
to 26. Now, this legacy of Cain's ungodliness, this legacy of anger, this legacy of murder leads in verses 17 through 22 to a legacy that is marked by worldliness. Now, you see this in the worldliness of Cain's family. Look at verse 17. Now, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Now, by the way, there's nothing inherently wrong with him knowing his wife and bearing children. That's what God called them to do. But notice the, the again, it's the complications or issues are often in the details. God judged him and told him he was going to be a wanderer and a fugitive on the earth. And what does he do? Does he wander here? No, he settles down. He builds a city. By the way, that's not, that's not a commentary on cities being inherently evil. Okay, God chooses a city for himself. We're all going to end up in a city in the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, right? Um, so let's not look down our noses at cities fundamentally. The problem is that Cain is in this action defying the very judgment of God. That's the problem. That's the problem. Now, the idea continues as you, I'm not going to read all the names in verse 18, but in the line of his descendants, you come finally from Cain six generations later to a man by the name of Lamech. And several verses there are dedicated to describing this man. And I want you to look at the worldliness of Lamech's family here. Um, so picking up in verse 19, Lamech took two wives. The name of one was Adah and the name of the other was Zillah. And then in 20 through 22, you see the children that these women bore to Lamech. But how do you see worldliness in his family line? Well, first, this is the first time in Scripture that we find mention of polygamy. Someone came to me a few weeks ago, and it, it was a good question. She asked me, why does the Bible, you know, seem to, seem to, you know, affirm polygamy? And I said, well, that, that's, that's a good question. You know, the Bible does talk about polygamy, even among God's people. Lamech is not one of God's people here, but it does mention it. What do you do with that? And I said to her, I said, well, I want you to think about it like this. The first person that commits polygamy is clearly a wicked man telling you the nature of polygamy. It's worldly. It's fleshly. I said, and second of all, you, you find me one example in the Old Testament, particularly of a man who committed polygamy, and, and, and show me where it really worked out well for him. It never does. It never does. The Bible describes it. It does not affirm it. I want to be clear about that. And how do you see the, the worldliness, the fleshliness of Lamech taking two wives? Well, you see it in, in the names of his wives and what those names mean. I've said before to you that in the Old Testament, oftentimes names mean something. Ada simply means, um, Ada means to adorn oneself or to put on ornaments. So it appears she's the type of woman who focuses entirely on her outward appearance and beauty. His other wife's name, Zillah, comes from a Hebrew word that means to tingle or to quiver. Ideally, in this case, with pleasure. This is a man of the flesh. And he's operating on his flesh, driving him to take two wives. So, tremendously worldly. Second, you can see the worldliness in his children that these two women bring forth and, and what they do. Now, I'm not going to focus on all of them. I'm going to focus on Tubal Cain. It says he's a forger of instruments of bronze and iron. And that, that Hebrew word forger means, that, that verb simply means you're sharpening like a, a weapon for war or for violence. This is a man who plans and lives for violence. And that's not inconsistent with his family's heritage. You can see the legacy of Cain's murder in the industry of his family. 
great, 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 great grandson. So, but look at the contrast in verses 25 to 26. I'm not going to go into all the details, but Seth is born as kind of a replacement, if I can say that, uh, to Abel. Seth bears a son, and then at the end of the chapter, and at that time, people begin to call upon the name of the Lord. Think about a worldly legacy in contrast to a godly legacy in another line. That's what's being highlighted. Now, this legacy of worldliness, as you can see clearly in verses 22 through 24, is again marked by violence, and this should not surprise us. In fact, I don't know if you, if you really ever picked up on this, but it, the way it's written in verses 23 and 24, this is in Hebrew poetic uh, structure, and I won't get into all the details, but it is interesting that this is essentially a song of mockery and boasting and pride and arrogance like Cain. He calls his wives to listen to him, and look what he says at the end of verse 23. I've killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. Now think about how this intensifies the legacy of murder and violence from Cain's line. Cain rose up against his brother, who probably didn't struggle too much, before he killed him. In this case, you could see that the earth is becoming filled more and more with violence because this, whoever this young man was attacked or was an aggressor to Lamech. What does Lamech do? Rises up and murders him. And then he boasts about it. Look what he says. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is 77-fold. I have outdone my father's. That's what he's saying. And he's celebrating it, and cheering it on. And such is the legacy of Cain's unchecked anger, his unchecked murder of his brother. We have to ask ourselves this question as we come to a close. In what ways do we see the legacy of anger manifest itself today? Well, we can see the legacy of unchecked sin and, and anger manifest itself through worldliness. We see it all around us. And violence in a variety of ways that this passage illustrates for us. I want you to think about the legacy of worldliness and unrepentant sin. When we fail to repent of our sin and deal with our own hearts, it has two I think, effects. The first effect is it creates a heart of worldliness within us. But I want you to think about it this way. The sin that is not dealt with today in your heart will produce a crop of worldliness and brokenness in the next generations that follow you. And it seems that the way of the world is that each succeeding generation goes over and above the sinfulness of their parents. This is what God meant when he said in the law, I will visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations. I don't, and I don't have kids, but if I did, I mean, you just never know how my sin that's not dealt with, that I've refused to work through before the Lord and under, under the power of the gospel of grace, how that sin will rub off on and be carried forward by my future generations. This is a very serious call because in this case it left a legacy of violence. And the violence was demonstrated maybe in ways you didn't, don't think are violent like polygamy and sexual avarice. Now, you may not think that that's, that's really violent, but it is. Now, polygamy today is not really a term that's used. It, it, apply, it implies like one man has many women and he marries them. We've gone further. You want to talk about taking sin further? We've taken it further in our day and age. We have a, we've invented a term, polyamory. Polyamory has nothing to do with marriage, and it has, it's not just for men. It includes women doing this too. It's men having multiple sexual partners or women having multiple sexual partners. 
And all within the rationale that, well, if they can, they're consenting adults, it's okay. But make no mistake about it. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman committing this. I mean, that this is a form of violence to those that you are with. Because you demean them, you devalue them by your very activities. You use them for nothing more than physical pleasure and stimulation, and you ignore the fact that they are a person with a heart and a soul underneath the skin. That is a form of violence. What our world calls love or free love is really not so free, and it's definitely not love. But it's actually rooted in violence stemming from, from being consumed by sin and lust, like Lamech. And please don't miss this. In Scripture, sexual sin is often paired with anger. Often paired with anger. Now, that's just one example of sin, and it's kind of an extreme example but it does exist in our world. The question for you this morning is, what if you have some kind of unjustified anger lurking below the surface of your heart? How do you deal with that in a redemptive way? How, does, how can that point you to Jesus Christ who brings healing? Well, I, I want to submit to you the fact that, as I said earlier, God is angry with sinners every day. I get that from the Psalms. But I want to drive you to Christ and realize that in Christ, God is not angry with you anymore. He's not. Your sin's been covered. He had every right to be angry with you and to judge you and give you the death penalty, but he didn't. He sent his son Jesus to go to that cross and receive the full wrath and anger of God on his head while he suffered for your sin. Why did he do that? Because more, more than being angry with you, he loved you. <laughs> and he wanted to reconcile with you. Not so that you would die, but so that you would have fullness of life. You remember what Jesus said? I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And so if you're struggling with anger, you need to go back and assess your relationship with the Lord and, and realize that in Christ, He's not angry with you. And if He's not angry with you, what right do you have to be angry with someone else whose sin against you doesn't compare with your sin against God? Boy, that'll put things in perspective. And you take that anger, you take that situation, you take that person that you might be angry with, and you bring them before the Lord. And you ask him to work through the issues of your heart, and you believe me, he will. He will. Doesn't mean that it's going to happen wim bam boom at the snap of a finger, but he will begin to bring healing to you. And the more he gives you healing, the less you will be consumed. And the less you are consumed, the greater joy you will have in living out the truth of the gospel in your relationships with other people and in this world. And that you might have a legacy one day, brothers and sisters, not of brokenness, but a legacy of blessedness in Christ. And that brings us back to our main idea, doesn't it? Unjustified anger, like all sin, has the power to consume us, earn the judgment of God, and leaves a legacy of brokenness behind us. But thank God for Jesus Christ, who took the anger for us. Let's pray.